My name is Scott Edwards. I am a professor of organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard University. I'm also a curator in the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And my lab studies molecular evolution and population genetics of birds, lizards, anything with scales. Uh, and we're very interested in how we can take genomic data to understand the evolutionary history of uh, different lineages of birds. Well, using mathematical approaches, there's a lot of advantages, I would say. Um, I mean, models have a very important role in, in my field. Of course, we know that many models aren't correct, but nonetheless, they still are extremely useful for helping us think about our data and for designing new experiments. So in my field, some of the kinds of models we think about are phylogeographic models, models of the history of populations. What sort of processes have led to the current diversity of populations and species that we see? And uh, models are really, they've helped guide us in terms of estimating parameters, how much gene flow, how much population growth has there been. But now the field is stepping back even more and asking, well, what is an appropriate model for this data set? What sort of processes could explain this data and what sort of processes are unlikely to have explained it? And that's in some ways an even more basic question than what are the actual numbers we can attach to those processes. And so they're turning out to be extremely important, extremely useful in my field. Well, mathematical approaches can be used in my field in a lot of ways. We could imagine uh, we want to know whether a given data set, in my case, a uh, data set might consist of a lot of DNA sequences. And we can imagine we could make some trees of each of those DNA sequences. Sometimes the trees will be the same, sometimes they'll be different, and we know that's the case because population genetics has a lot of stochasticity in it. So we might use a mathematical model to ask about the distribution of those gene trees. Do we see a predominance of one type? Do we see a sort of even distribution where all the different types are equally represented? And mathematics can give us uh, insight into what sort of processes are happening given those distributions. So um, that's an example of using um, math to combine with observed data to come up with a uh, plausible scenario for the evolution of a group of species. I think we've learned a lot of new things about the evolutionary history of, of species, including our own species, from mathematics. And so, for example, through mathematical models, we can estimate such things as how big was the population of the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. This is something, this is a population that existed millions of years ago, and our only window into that are DNA sequences and the pattern of nucleotides that we see in present day species. So mathematical models can tell us how big that population was, or whether that population was a single randomly mating population or one that had many different subpopulations in it, sort of a structured population. And that's, that type of insight has been very important for my field, to probe into history and see what sort of uh, events might have taken place. Mathematical biology is becoming a big workhorse of the scientific world. In my field, it's really rising to the fore, whereas we used to spend much of our time in the lab generating data now the data isn't the issue, it's the computation and the mathematical analysis of this data. And so mathematical models are just really coming to the fore in terms of uh, generating hypotheses, testing hypotheses. And I view my uh, role as a scientist increasingly as involving mathematical approaches.